There's an unresolved ambiguity in the book's account of beliefs in God. One line of argument suggests that the origins of religion are to be found in human fear. We're afraid of nature, and so we invent a God as a way of explaining nature. This is a thesis that is cribbed from Thomas Hobbes. It's a thesis that will return in a variety of forms in subsequent thinkers. Along with this comes an important corollary. Since religion arises out of the weakness of human beings in the face of nature, anything that improves the ability of individuals to resist or control nature, science, for instance, should pave the way to a lessening of religious fervor. But there's another line of argument that runs through the book, a much more sinister account of the origins of religion that locates it not in fear but in deceit. Religion is a ruse that's used by cunning politicians, such as the three imposters. It's a ruse that they employ as a way of making their position more secure. This was an art that Moses originated, that Jesus practiced, although it has to be said in the account of the treatise of the three imposters, it's with less than happy results for him, and that Muhammad perfected. The origins of this account of religion can perhaps be traced to certain Roman writers, and it found a more recent expression in the works of the great Renaissance political philosopher Niccolo Machiavelli. Indeed, there's one passage in the treatise in its discussion of Moses that sounds like something that could have been lifted from Machiavelli's prints. It reads, trickery without arms rarely succeeds, a statement which could be compared to Machiavelli's famous dictum that unarmed prophets always fail. It is the second argument that does most of the work in the treatise and which provides the main argument of the book. Religion is simply, in other words, the continuation of politics by other means. Thus, the treatise discusses the quote-unquote politics of Jesus Christ before moving on to his moral teachings, which are then dismissed as representing little or nothing in the way of an improvement over what could be found in other ancient texts. Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad are impostors in the two senses which the word is used in the 18th century. They are, first of all, liars and fakes. They present themselves as something they were not. But, and here's another inconsistency, they're also prodigies, another sense of the term, imposter. They possess extraordinary skills, although, let it be said, if they are worldly skills. These are people who know magic, and they know how to use it. Again, this is a tension. Though the treatise argues that there is nothing supernatural about these three, the accounts of their skills make them appear almost superhuman. Shifting gears again, the book lurches into a discussion of evidence of the nature of the soul. The arguments are cribbed once again from Spinoza, but the cribbing greatly simplifies his arguments, and what emerges is a rather straightforward materialism a good deal simpler than anything that the great Dutch philosopher had actually argued. But, as I've already suggested, none of this matters. Or more precisely, worrying about how faithful the text is to Spinoza is missing what this is all about. Here, in the pages of one rather brief and blunt book, is a collection of heresies that one would have to plow through the footnotes and commentaries of Bale's dictionary to uncover. And these are heresies that, at least in this book, are put into the service of a denunciation of a political regime that had driven many of its readers into exile. The manuscript that Levier copied resided in the library of a man named Benjamin Furley. He was a Quaker immigrant from Colchester whose father had been a loyal supporter of the Republic during the English Revolution of the Commonwealth. And after the restoration of the monarchy in England, he was imprisoned for his beliefs. Now, Furley had a massive library. It was filled with clandestine and heretical books. He also maintained a salon and a society in Rotterdam that was called The Lantern. And this would serve as a meeting point for exiled English Republicans, Dutch dissenters, and French refugees. A number of paths begin to cross in Furley's house the paths of people we've been talking about in the last several lectures. Locke lived there for a while in the 1680s. Furley was good friends with the English free thinker Anthony Collins. John Toland seems to have been there in the early 1690s. So 
While we remain unclear as to who the author of this scandalous book might have been, we now see that perhaps it really doesn't matter. Books like this were a collective project. They were put together by a number of individuals who were united in a hatred of the French monarchy and united by a conviction that religion had been deeply involved in politics. These individuals had connections with most of the people that we are going to be talking about in these lectures. And tracing the Treatise of the Three Impostors, we seem to have stumbled upon an international conspiracy of freethinkers and republicans firing off broadsides to the French monarchy. So just beyond the borders of France, what would become the Enlightenment was being organized. The Treatise of the Three Impostors has taken us into the underground of the Enlightenment, into the most radical part of the Enlightenment. But some of these same ideas that you can find in this book found expression in more moderate form. Some of the ideas that were expressed in this book prompted other more mainstream thinkers of the Enlightenment to rethink what it was that they were doing. So next time, we'll leave the literary underworld of the Enlightenment and talk about the man who is most often associated with the Enlightenment, the great public figure who would, for many, define the age of the Enlightenment, Voltaire. This ends Lecture 3. The Enlightenment, Lecture 4, Voltaire and the Campaign Against Fanaticism. So, having spent our last lecture looking around in the world of clandestine manuscripts and radical enlighteners in Amsterdam and outside of France, I want to move today to consider the life and career of a figure who has come to epitomize the so-called High Enlightenment namely Voltaire, who lives from 1694 to 1778. It's hard to figure out what to call him or to explain what exactly it is that he did. He called himself a philosopher, a philosopher, but he's not a philosopher in any sense that perhaps we would recognize philosophers today. He was, first of all, and above all else, a writer and a remarkably successful one. He parlayed his talents at writing, his talents at ingratiating himself with others, and his talent for finding productive uses for the money that he was able to get from his patrons into a rather good income. By the end of his life, he'd established a highly profitable watchmaking and lace-making business at his chateau. And while it is true that he was forced to flee Paris because of the opposition that his writings provoked, it's worth remembering that he f fled Paris to some rather nice chateaus. As a thinker, he really can't measure up to the stature of those whose works he popularized. He wasn't a Newton, he wasn't a Locke. But it was that role of a popularizer of the works of others that is really essential here. He explained what others had done, and he showed what might be done with their ideas. In other words, he was a philosoph in that rather particular sense of the term that the word has in the 18th century, rather than a philosopher in our sense. The terms don't translate each other. This was a man who excelled at polemics. He was a brilliant essayist. He was gifted with the ability to make his ideas public, and particularly to turn his ideas into causes. So let's begin with a sketch of his life, and then say a few things about two of his most important works his Letters Concerning the English Nation, in which he offers one of the first sketches of what becomes seen as the origins of the Enlightenment, and then talk about his various campaigns against fanaticism in his great philosophical dictionary of 1764. Voltaire wasn't his real name. It was a pen name that he adopted. There are various explanations for why he picked it. None of them are particularly compelling. He was a sickly child. He was expected to die. Um, he grew up to be a sickly man and at various points in his life was convinced that he was about to die, but yet went on to live a rather right, to a rather ripe old age. His parents sent him to schools and Jesuit schools in Paris that were favored by the wealthy and influential 
Paris aristocrats, although he in fact came from a fairly prosperous but nevertheless middle class family. Their hopes seemed to be that he would make the right sorts of connections there and be able to pursue a career in law and perhaps become part of what was called the nobility of the robe. These were uh, nobles, who, who people who served the king. He was educated in Latin and Greek classics. The reason you studied these in Jesuit schools was that they were supposed to serve as gateways, uh, as the path to higher Christian truths. Voltaire took from them rather different messages than he was supposed to get and found in them a style of thinking which he would make his own, a style which combined a rather eclectic fusion of elements from the Stoics, the Epicureans, and the Skeptics. After various adventures and misadventures in Paris and Holland, including various attempts to settle down to study law, he finally embarked on a literary career and gained early fame as a writer of satirical verses and odes. He secured his literary fame with a tragedy on, based on Oedipus in 1718 and on an epic poem honoring the, the great French monarch Henry IV, who he viewed as, a, as an early advocate of religious toleration. Now, some of his more satirical writings led to a short exile in Holland in 1713, a brief imprisonment in the Bastille in 1717 and 1718, and he was imprisoned once again in 1726, this time for his own protection, after he was beaten by a bunch of thugs who'd been hired by a Parisian aristocrat who had a grudge against Voltaire. When he was released from the Bastille this time, he decided it was time to leave the country and traveled to England, where he spent the years from 1726 to 1729 mastering the English language and studying English politics, philosophy, literature, and also observing English cultural and religious life. His letters on the English nation, which was also published under the title Philosophical Letters in 1734, recorded the fruits of this journey. The letters were condemned in Paris as subversive and irreligious and were burned by the hangman. One of the hangman's jobs when he wasn't hanging people was to execute books as well as human beings. He settled outside the city and moved in the summer of 1734 to the chateau of Madame du Châtelet. She had become his lover in the previous year and would remain so for the next 15 years while her husband, a good 18th century aristocrat, did what good 18th century aristocrats did. Namely, he ignored his wife's affair and went out and had an affair of his own. The Madame de Châtelet was a woman of considerable intelligence. She was had an ability to pick up languages rather quickly, and she proved to be a rather able translator of English works. She was well-versed in classical philosophy. She'd studied the works of Newton and Leibniz, and she was interested in philosophical and theological questions. She was also a rather good mathematician. During his time with her, Voltaire worked on plays, on philosophical tales, and began to write the histories, such as his, his uh, Age of Louis XIV and his essays on customs. In the company of Madame de Châtelet, he also engaged in a verse-by-verse -verse study of the Bible. This must have been one of the most impious Bible study sessions in history, aiming at uncovering contradictions and absurdities in the work and much of this would subsequently find a home in his Philosophical Dictionary of 1764. The Madame de Châtelet died in 1749. She died in childbirth, the child in this case being the child of yet another lover. In 1750, Voltaire moved briefly to the court of Frederick II of Prussia, Frederick the Great, who had for many years been trying to lure him there in order to add luster to the newly established Berlin Academy, the stay ended in a bitter quarrel over what Frederick regarded as the unscrupulous behavior of Voltaire while there and what Voltaire regarded as the overly imperious behavior on the part of Frederick. It's a rather complicated story, but there's something to be said for the charges that both of them made against the other. Voltaire spent a number of years traveling throughout Europe before moving to his own estate near Geneva, where he wrote his celebrated story Candide from 1759 as well as his Treatise on Toleration, 1763, and his Philosophical Dictionary of 1764. 
the latter his most important contribution to the campaign against religious fanaticism. The treatise on toleration was the fruit of his involvement in a case involving Jean Callas, a Huguenot cloth merchant who was tortured and executed in 1762 for the murder of his son. The allegation was that Callas had murdered his son in order to prevent him from converting to Catholicism. In fact, the son seems to have committed suicide. Voltaire was convinced that Callas had been wrongly convicted, and he launched a campaign to rehabilitate the man's name and to reform the legal system that allowed for such an abuse of justice to be carried out. As part of this campaign, he wrote the Treatise on Toleration and also added the articles Torture, because Callas was tortured before as part of his execution, and Fraud to later editions of the Philosophical Dictionary. And here he argued against the use of torture and questioned whether the government must not speak honestly even to the lowest of its citizens. He succeeded eventually in having Collis's conviction reversed in 1765, and he would engage in subsequent years in similar campaigns on the part of other victims of injustice. He returned to Paris in 1778 in triumph and died a few months later at the age of 84. Now, I want to look more closely at the letters on the English nation, because it's in this work that Voltaire offered what is really one of the first sketches of what later comes to be viewed as the tradition from which the Enlightenment has sprung. Voltaire was in England from May of 1726 to October of 1728. He taught himself English by attending plays. He, he came to London with letters of introduction to the most important political figures on the English scene. He also met with important literary figures, as well as with uh, lesser-known figures in the English culture of the day. He met, for instance, uh, Sir Isaac Newton's niece. He kept a notebook in which he recorded the observations of what he'd seen, and this became the basis of his letters concerning the English nation. The first publication was in an English translation of 1733. It appeared in French in the next year. Now, superficially, the letters concerning the English nation looks a bit like a piece of travel literature. In it, you find a series of random observations in the opening chapters on the various religious groups in England, then on the government and customs of the English. Then there, there's a discussion of some of their most significant thinkers, such as Sir Francis Bacon, John Locke, Isaac Newton. There's a discussion of various English writers. And it closes with some observations on how men of letters should be treated, on the importance of academies. And in later editions of the work, there's a long critique of the French philosopher Pascal, who really doesn't fit into the story at all, but is important for French readers because of a conflict in between Jesuits and Jansenists that's taking place in, in France at this time. But to see this work simply as, as a work of travel literature, as a neutral reporting, is to miss what's really central to it. What Voltaire is doing here and what impresses him most about England is that he's trying to explain how a different culture is possible, how a different world has been created in England, a world which combines three elements, religious nonconformity and toleration, a scientific empiricist approach to philosophy, and what might be called political liberalism, an ideal of limited government. The book opens with a series of articles on Quakers. It moves on to discuss the Church of England and then looks at Presbyterians and Socinians, one of the many heresies of the period. There are three points that are worth noting here. How Voltaire approaches these religions, what he finds interesting about them, and what he has to say about the English attitude towards religion in general. He treats religion as something that involves life, not as something which involves simply belief. His concern is with how people act towards one another. He doesn't really care about doctrines very much. All doctrines are equally suspect in his eyes. They consist of people picking out various quotations that support their beliefs, 
and ignoring all the rest. All of them are equally irrelevant. All of these doctrines are equally irrelevant. Um, as one of his informants tells him, thou art a Christian without being circumcised, and I am a Christian without being baptized. He's particularly interested in Quakers, and he's fascinated by them. He's interested by their modes of dress, by the attitudes that they have upon meeting one another, and most of all, by their equality, by their commitment to equality, by the way in which they use the familiar thou when talking both to kings and to cobblers. The major lesson that he takes from the trip to England involving religion is that a plurality of religions has the promise of bringing about a lessening of religious antagonisms. England is a country of different religions. As he puts it, quote, an Englishman as a free man goes to heaven by whichever road he pleases. And what impresses him most about England is that religions there have proliferated to the point where differences in religious belief do not matter at all. In what is perhaps the most famous passage in the book, he writes, Go into the stock exchange in London, and you will see representatives of all the nations assembled for the profit of mankind. There the Jew, the Mohammedan, and the Christian deal with one another as if they were of the same religion and reserve the name of infidel for those who go bankrupt. In other words, there's only one sin possible on the Royal Exchange of London, losing money. Now it's the number of religions that allows for toleration. He writes, if there were only one religion in England, there would be the danger of tyranny. We might say, parenthetically, this is a danger of tyranny, which he sees all too evident uh, in his own native France. He goes on, if there were only two, they would cut each other's throats. And this is something which he knows all too well from the history of battles between French Protestants and French Catholics. Then he goes on, but there are 30 and they live happily together in peace. Now, throughout his life, Voltaire was said to be haunted by one image, one image of religious fanaticism, and that was the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre of 1572. It takes place during the wars of religion in France, and over the space of a few days, as many as 3,000 Protestants are slaughtered in Paris. It's said that on the anniversary of St. Bartholomew's Day, Voltaire regularly ran a fever. It was as if his entire body was convulsed by the memory of the event. And what had opened up for him in England was a vision of a world in which events like that did not take place. Events like that could not take place because there were so many different religions that they, no one religion could dominate the others. So in other words, what impresses him most about England is that it shows how a diversity of religious sects can live peacefully side by side, and what they put into practice is that ideal to which Voltaire would devote much of the rest of his life, the ideal of toleration. Perhaps Voltaire's greatest contribution to this struggle for toleration was the Philosophical Dictionary of 1764. When he writes this work, he has at least two possible models available to him. One is Pierre Bell's Historical and Critical Dictionary of 1697, which I've mentioned in a previous lecture. The other is Diderot's great encyclopedia, a massive work which has been proceeding with many difficulties from 1751 until it's eventually finished uh, some 20 years later. Uh, we'll talk about that in later lectures. Voltaire had been a contributor to the encyclopedia, but he began to keep his distance from this project as difficulties mounted. Neither of these were the sort of work that he wanted to produce. They were big works. They were expensive works. Indeed, the encyclopedia was a massive and a very expensive work. Voltaire's goal was to produce a cheap, portable work which could do what these larger works really couldn't do, namely be easily accessible to individuals and to bring about a revolution in the way in which people thought about the world. 
The Philosophical Dictionary consists of short, often witty, and caustic discussions of religion and politics and of many other things. One example perhaps shows you the style of the work. Look at the entry, for instance, on self-love, in which, in a really memorable phrase, Voltaire writes, Self-love is the instrument of our conservation. It resembles the instrument which perpetuates the species. It is necessary. It is dear to us. It gives us pleasure. And it must be hidden. A passage like this, clever, slightly naughty, rather witty, sparkles in the way in which individuals who knew Voltaire described his face. He was said to have a witty, caustic expression. He was said to have sparkling, mischievous eyes. Page after page of the Philosophical Dictionary sparkles with that sort of prose. The dictionary mounts a sustained campaign against what Voltaire sees as the central delusions of religion. One way of trying to see how this critique works is to look at a series of entries in the dictionary. We could think of these entries as a, as, as a ladder of worse and worse sorts of delusions. Let's start with prejudices, the entry on prejudices. Prejudices are defined as irrational opinions. They're opinions instilled in children before they can make use of reason. The term, at least, as, at least for Voltaire, is a relatively mild term of criticism. He argues that there are universal and necessary prejudices. Indeed, for Voltaire, virtue itself is a prejudice. And if we're lucky, these various prejudices will eventually become ratified by reason. Next up is faith. Faith, as Voltaire understands it, is a belief in what appears to our understanding to be false. And Voltaire is troubled that the church requires us to have faith in an astonishing number of things, many of these things quite contradictory. Against this, Voltaire mounts what would be the standard deist critique. It is absolutely impossible for God to require us to believe something that's self-contradictory. Otherwise, he wouldn't be God. God gave us reason. God's truth should be acceptable, should be understandable uh, through reason, should be acceptable to reason. We shouldn't have to make a leap of faith to understand what's really important about religion. A third type of delusion becomes a bit more dangerous. It's called enthusiasm. It's defined by Voltaire uh, literally as internal agitation. And he describes, in another essay, he describes the enthusiast as, quote, a man who takes dreams for realities and his imagination for prophecies. In general, it's rather difficult to unite reason, which sees things as they are, with enthusiasm, since enthusiasm tends to excite the nerves and thus impede our ability to reason. He makes, though, surprisingly one exception, and this, too, is typical of other 18th century thinkers. Enthusiasm can play a positive role in one particular field, the arts. Poets, he argues, make use of something called rational enthusiasm. Reason lays out a, like a race course, and enthusiasm takes us down it and races us down this course. Moving up on Voltaire's ladder of infamy, we can come to superstition. In one of his many analogies, he writes, the superstitious man is related to the rascal as a slave is to a tyrant. A superstitious man, in other words, doesn't act on his own. He's enslaved by someone else. More dangerously, the superstitious man tends to be dominated by the fanatic and in the end, he eventually becomes a fanatic. Now, the possibility of having a people that can live without superstition, that possibility rests on the level of enlightenment which has been attained within a middle class of society, which he argues has been active in all the major popular disturbances and popular disruptions, but has now become more gentler and possibly more philosophical. If the middle class becomes more enlightened, this will soften the rest of society, 
This will make the rest of society much gentler. From this emerges a conception of what the process of enlightenment is supposed to involve. It's going to involve a critique of superstition and how it's going to proceed. It's going to move from the middle classes outwards. Last, we come to that greatest of evils, fanaticism. As Voltaire writes, fanaticism is to superstition as delirium is to fever as fury is to anger. Fanaticism acts upon enthusiasm and it moves the individual to engage in violent actions. The St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre serves, as always, as a reminder of the sorts of evils that fanaticism can unleash. Against fanaticism, reasoning, religion, and laws are equally impotent. Voltaire writes, you can't argue with a fanatic. And religion is particularly inept at dealing with fanaticism. If you look at the entry on religion in the Philosophical Dictionary, it reads like a continuation of the entry on fanaticism. It's a powerful evocation of all the violence that religion has unleashed on the world. The only hope lies with what Voltaire calls philosophy. Philosophy makes the soul tranquil, he writes, and fanaticism is incompatible with tranquility. But does this mean that everyone has to become a philosopher? In the end, Voltaire seems to assume that most individuals will continue to need religion of some sort, and so it is essential that these religions take a form which resist fanaticism. Some suggestions on, on what might be contained in a religion which remained within the limits of reason could be found in his discussion of theism, and also a rather curious essay called The Chinese Catechism. Voltaire seemed to assume that the Chinese were a truly philosophical people. He credits the Chinese with an argument for the existence of God that resembles something like the traditional deist argument from design, the notion that a complex and elegant mechanism such as the universe implies an intelligent designer. He's also rather impressed by the Confucian moral code, which he writes places an emphasis on our relations with one another. As for belief in the afterlife, the argument's left rather vague. He's unable to prove whether there is one or whether there isn't. The account of religion and morality that you find in these pages seems to be quite consistent with Voltaire's own approach to such questions. From an early age, Voltaire concluded that metaphysical questions are essentially unknowable. There's a letter he writes to Frederick the Great in which he says that metaphysical ideas are, quote, like flashes in the midst of a dark night. And that, I think, is all that we can hope of metaphysics. It seems improbably that the first things can never be known. The mice living in a few holes of an immense building do not know if the building is eternal, who is the architect, or why the architect built it. They try to preserve their lives, to populate their holes, and to escape the destructive animals which pursue them. We are the mice. And the divine architect who built this universe has not, so far as I know, told his secret to any of us. But this metaphysical skepticism that Voltaire has doesn't entail a skepticism about morality. Voltaire is confident that there is one morality, and all men know it, whether they have read philosophy or not. They find it in their hearts, and morality comes from God like light. Our superstitions, he writes, are nothing but darkness. By the end of Voltaire's life, perhaps in part because of his campaign in the Collis case and other confrontations with the corruption of French law, he was moving towards positions that were, for his time, quite radical. While, like other writers on politics, he tended to view democracy as a form of rule best suited to small territories, he nevertheless insisted that governments will do less harm when they are popular rather than autocratic. Likewise, while he believed that absolute equality was impossible, and indeed even a bad idea, he insisted that every man had a right to believe himself equal to every other man 
and that the real evil laid not so much in inequality, but in the state of dependence that certain particular forms of inequality, such as those of aristocratic societies, tended to produce. When Voltaire made his final visit to Paris to receive the honors of his contemporaries, he probably struck them as a little bit out of date. His battles against religious fanaticism must have struck enlightened Parisians as a relic of a rather unhappy past, something from the 16th or early 17th centuries that had now been banished in this ever more enlightened age. Voltaire was not so sure about that. The symptoms of fanaticism may have gone underground, but the disease he felt was still there, so long as people were capable of believing in a world beyond this one, and a God who makes demands upon them that run contrary to what natural reason and natural morality tell them to do, then there's the danger of new outrages still to come. The earth will not be safe from fanatics, he thought, as long as fanaticism continued to poison men's minds, and it was perhaps for that reason that every St. Bartholomew's Day he ran that fever. Over the last several years, fears like Voltaire's don't seem old-fashioned at all. And perhaps that's why Voltaire, for better or worse, remains our contemporary. So, with some reluctance, why don't we leave Voltaire behind? And over the next several lectures, I want to turn from the world of ideas to the world of institutions to look not simply at what individuals in the Enlightenment wrote, but instead at the world in which they lived, a world of scientific academies, a world of salons and coffee houses, a world of secret societies, and a world that had a rather flourishing clandestine book trade. This ends Lecture 4. Remember to visit this course's webpage at www.modernscholar.com where you'll find additional information about the lectures you just heard. The Enlightenment, Lecture 5, The Emergence of the Public Sphere, Part 1, Academies and the Quest for Useful Knowledge. Over the next three lectures, what I'd like to do is turn from what the Enlightenment battled, namely fanaticism, superstition, religious intolerance, and instead talk about what it created, or the world that it came to inhabit. Namely, a set of new social institutions that have come to be called the public sphere. The term public sphere itself comes from a 1961 book by the German philosopher and social theorist Jürgen Habermas, which could be translated as the structural transformation of the public sphere. Habermas argued that the economic and social development of Europe in the 17th and 18th centuries gave rise to the creation of a domain in which, as he put it, private individuals started coming together to deliberate about public concerns. By private individuals, Habermas meant people who were not vested with political authority, who weren't part of the official apparatus of the state. They were one might say bourgeois, members of the so-called third estate in France. These would be people who were neither clergy nor aristocracy. And there were a number of different settings in which these people started to gather. These settings include coffee houses, salons, Masonic lodges, societies for reading, libraries, places where you discuss journals and newspapers. And over the next several lectures, what I wanted to do was look at some of these places. I wanted to begin today, though, with an institution that, for reasons that should become evident pretty quickly, doesn't quite fit into Habermas's model, but which is tremendously important for the spread of useful knowledge in the 18th century, namely scientific academies. And after we've talked about the origin and the function of scientific academies, we can look at one example of how one rather famous individual made use of this new network to spread useful knowledge of his own sort, namely Benjamin Franklin and his uh, famous invention of the lightning rod. But first, to the origin of academies.
At the close of his letter concerning the English nation, Voltaire observes that the Royal Society of London, which was founded in 1660, differs in rather dramatic ways from its French equivalent, the French Academy of Sciences, which was founded six years later. The French Academy was a government agency whose members were appointed by the crown and, with that appointment, received pensions. The Royal Society, in contrast, was royal really in name only. It relied on voluntary contributions of the fellows, who joined it because of the status that its membership conferred or the opportunities for sociability that membership in the Royal Society offered. The French Academy of Sciences exemplified what was really the typical pattern on the continent. There, academies were part of the apparatus of the absolute estate, like chapels or theaters or even royal opera houses, academies were one of the ways in which monarchs manifested their power, and they fit rather neatly into the absolutist program of making sure that no group was capable of functioning outside of state surveillance and control. Indeed, the origins of the Académie Française, the, Fr the French Academy, which was the literary counterpart of the Academy of Sciences, dates from 1635, when Cardinal Richelieu, upon learning that a group of literary men were meeting secretly, managed to persuade them to form themselves into, official, into an official public body, all the better to keep watch over what it was that they were doing. In contrast, English academies remained private. The most famous, of course, is the Royal Society of London for the Promotion of Natural Knowledge, uh, to give the full name of the Royal Society in this lecture at least once. It was founded in the 1660s by individuals who were inspired by Sir Francis Bacon's ideal of collective research. It was, though, about as haphazard as Bacon himself was in its interests, partially at least, because the notion that we have of science as an area of inquiry that focuses on a specific range of problems didn't really yet exist. Science was still largely an activity of amateurs. And over the history of the Royal Society, there were periods of decline. Under Isaac Newton's presidency, it took a more coherent and professional character, though in the 1740s it declined once again into a sort of gentleman's club. Then in the 1780s it was revived again by the great naturalist Joseph Banks. Another very important British scientific society was the Lunar Society of Birmingham. It took that name because it held its meetings on the Monday closest to the full moon. The meetings were picked to coincide with the full moon because in a city that, yet, that had yet to have public lighting, this was one of the ways in which you could find your way home at night after meetings of the, of the society. It included such prominent individuals as um, the engineer Matthew Bolton, uh, the man who would later be the partial inventor of the steam engine, the pottery maker Josiah Wedgwood, and polymaths who ventured across the areas of religion and the sciences such as Joseph Priestley and Erasmus Darwin. Now, whether an academy was public or private, no matter what its origins were, there were a number of important functions that it uh, carried out, and perhaps we should say something about them briefly. First of all, academies provided support for intellectuals. This was most obvious in the case of state-funded academies. They offered those who were fortunate enough to receive posts support to carry out their scholarship, and they could be untroubled by the need to put any additional thought into making a living. For this reason, positions in state-funded academies were quite desirable. Indeed, the attractiveness of a position like this can scarcely be overestimated. It meant an end to the need to seek out patrons, to serve as a tutor to a nobleman's son, or, in what was always the riskiest of alternatives, it meant an end to trying to earn a living by one's own pen. Hence the intense competition in France to get such posts. It was for this reason, perhaps, that those who were involved in the production of Diderot's Great Encyclopedia, of which we will have more to say in a, few, in a few more lectures, it's for that reason that these people mounted a concerted effort to get positions for themselves and their colleagues in the various academies. Winning such positions by the middle of the century, 
had come to be viewed as an indication of the growing strength of the young insurgents around the encyclopedia. By the end of the century, this may have begun to look a little bit different, as the historian Robert Darnton has suggested, when a generation of younger writers came to Paris, hoping that they could emulate the success of the philosophes who had battled their way into the academy, they found that there were really no longer any more positions to be had, and the philosophes had grown old, and at least in their eyes, fat, while Rousseau, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the man who had rejected this society, the very society that they were trying to join, came to exercise a particular attraction to those writers who saw themselves as unable to find positions in this stratified and now very competitive society. We should not assume that the only support that academies could render was financial. Those who joined groups like the Lunar Society or the Royal Society at their own expense certainly got something back in return. What they got back was the opportunity for intellectual support and some type of solidarity with others. The inspiration of the Royal Society and many of the other English societies that followed its model can be traced back to Francis Bacon's ideal of science as a necessarily collective undertaking. Research was something that was best carried out in concert with others. Ideas, it was argued, were meant to be shared. Experimental data was meant to be circulated. What was gradually starting to grow up was an international network of scientific societies that would publish the results of their proceedings, that could receive visitors from other societies, and indeed might confer what was called corresponding memberships to members of other countries and they would send their articles back and forth, write letters back and forth, report on what they'd been doing. This is part of something that we've already been talking about in certain earlier lectures, namely the development of a potentially cosmopolitan community of readers and writers. The notion that Pierre Bell had in that journal of his, uh, The News of the Republic of Letters, this was something which was taking on a new urgency and a great deal of growth with this interest in science. For the language of nature, after all, was truly universal, and the laws of nature were indifferent to any sort of natural borders. There was a second function to the academies, and this too was Baconian in its inspiration, namely the notion that useful knowledge should be circulated. Now, in Francis Bacon's tireless propaganda on the part of science, he emphasized again and again that knowledge was power, that science wasn't something, as was at this point still widely believed, simply an idle pastime, a sort of game that you played out in the parlor with instruments that had no practical implications. It was not something that was only to be engaged in by eccentric individuals or village parsons who had nothing better to do with their time. He stressed again and again that scientific discoveries held out the prospect of providing sovereigns with unforeseen powers. Though significantly, he had very little in the way of actual usable technology to point to at this point. The compass tended to be his favorite example. There was also gunpowder. But at the time he was writing, it was still rather difficult to make the case that science had any real practical implications. We see the notion that academies should be providing useful knowledge. One of the places where you can see this ideal symbolized rather nicely is the seal of the academy in Turin. Across the top of its emblem are the words veritas et utilitas, truth and utility. This, after all, was Bacon's point. It was supposed to try to show science was supposed to have results. It was supposed to make the world a better place. And a number of studies that historians have done of provincial academies in France show that these academies cultivated a variety of interests that would be of particular concern to the regions in which they were located and also the interests of their members. And much the same can be said of groups like the Lunar Society in Birmingham, which linked scientific research and commercial interests in a rather important part of England, a part of England that was gearing up for the explosion of commercial and industrial activity that would be coming in a few decades. A third function of the academies was to provide some type of orientation, some type of direction for research. 
And one highly influential way of doing this involved the awarding of prizes in conjunction with competitions that called for essays on particular questions. These questions many times transcended scientific research as we would understand it, but were still part of this broader search for useful knowledge. The Academy in Dijon, for example, sponsored a competition on the question of whether the revival of the arts and sciences had improved the morals of mankind. And it was this essay that would be won by the young Frenchman, actually the young Genevan transplanted to Paris, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and would become the topic of his first discourse, the work that first secured his literary fame. A few years later, the Dijon Academy sponsored another contest, this time on the question of the origins of inequality among mankind, and Rousseau would enter this again. This would be the subject matter for his second discourse, the discourse on the origins of inequality. He would not, however, win the prize. The Berlin Academy also sponsored competitions, and indeed one of its competitions drew a wide range of submissions of intellectuals from throughout Europe. The question at issue here was the question of what was the origin of human language? How did language develop? And this, as I said, every major figure and many of the major figures in the Enlightenment submitted uh, contributions to this, to this contest. It also sponsored, at the request of the Prussian monarch Frederick the Great, a contest uh, on the question of whether it was ever useful for a king to deceive his subjects. And the academy, in this case, thought that discretion might be the better part of valor. And so they made sure that in the case of this essay contest, they would award prizes for both yes and no answers. So you could win the prize by saying, yes, monarchs should deceive their people. Or you could win the contest by saying, no, monarchs should never deceive their people. So these, then, are three functions which academies carried out. And perhaps we can get a better idea of how all this worked by looking at the case of one man and one invention, namely Benjamin Franklin and his lightning rod. Now, Benjamin Franklin's experiment is part of the common American folklore, or at least it is in Philadelphia, uh, where I grew up. Those who relate the story typically express amazement that Franklin wasn't killed in the process, and that's perhaps why every discussion of the experiment you'll find, especially those directed at school children, stresses one thing about this, don't try it at home. The account of the kite experiment is usually included as part of a more general picture that we have of Benjamin Franklin, a crusty, pragmatic inventor who was always concerned with practicality above all else. This, after all, is the image which was perfected by the man who invented the figure of poor Richard. And sadly, the image of poor Richard, Franklin's creation, has tended to devour the real Benjamin Franklin. So the kite flying experiment, like his attempted use of electricity to kill a turkey one Christmas, it turns out that chickens were much easier to kill with electricity than turkeys. The kite flying experiment is seen as part of what is usually presented as an undisciplined and eccentric approach to science, which at least in this case, wound up having one important practical result, the invention of lightning rods. But as the Harvard historian of science, I. Bernard Cohen, has shown in a number of articles, which he's nicely collected in a book called Benjamin Franklin's Science, this folk wisdom greatly underestimates Franklin's real achievement. First of all, it underestimates the extent of Franklin's theoretical interests. It's true that he was unable to make much use of Newton's Principia because, as he himself often lamented, he lacked the mathematical competence that would be necessary to read it. But in that, he was hardly alone. This was a book aimed for scholars. For that reason, it was written in Latin. And fortunately, there was another book that Newton wrote, and this was the book which people actually read, especially those interested in science. That book was Newton's Optics published in 1704. It was written in English. It lacked the sort of mathematical proofs that you found in the Principia. And this is principally because Newton was was unable to bring his work on light to the same level of systematic rigor that he'd achieved in studying the laws of motion. So 
in reading the optics, you do not find laws that are the result of elaborate mathematical deductions. They are instead presented by means of questions and propositions, which are followed by various suggestions about how you would carry out proofs by experiments. Here, in other words, was a book that could be read by someone who had not mastered the calculus, but who did have the ability to reflect on propositions and to try to construct experiments that might test these propositions. And these were precisely the skills that Franklin and others who were working in the area of electricity had. From his reading of the optics, Franklin came to speculate that perhaps electricity was a fluid, one of those fluids that Newton had described as being a much subtler medium than air. The idea was that because these fluids were exceedingly small, they could penetrate ordinary bodies and flow through them quite easily. In reports sent to England between 1747 and 1749, and in a subsequent book, Experiments and Observations in Electricity, a book that was widely reprinted and widely translated, Franklin proceeded to elaborate an account of electricity that made use of the vocabulary that this account of fluids in Newton seemed to imply. And indeed, Franklin achieved a quite remarkable success with this vocabulary, since the vocabulary that Franklin uses to describe electricity still contains much of the vocabulary that we use to this very day. After all, we talk about current that flows through conductors and that flows in a certain direction. All of this language is still with us, even though we've come to a rather different understanding of electricity than the understanding that Franklin had. The starting point for a good many of Franklin's experiments was the idea, as he put it, that, quote, electrical fire is a real element or species of matter not created by friction but collected only. And what he's thinking about here was that it was well known that if you rubbed certain materials with fur or with felt, you could draw electrical sparks off of them. This was the so-called creation of the fire and the theory that was prevalent at the time was that it was friction itself that had created this fire. The model here was perhaps the notion that rubbing a stick will make it heat up and perhaps, if you're lucky enough, burst into flame. Franklin viewed these matters rather differently. He saw the activity of rubbing the stick as a way of moving matter from one place to another, and the spark involved moving it back again, or as he put it in yet another analogy from fluids, he called it the drawing off of the charge. Now the notion that there was a link between lightning and electricity was the most famous of the conjectures that Franklin made, and it's famous not simply because it proved to be something that had a great deal of important practical implications. What needed to be shown at this point was that electrical phenomena were not merely something that were produced in the parlor through the use of various instruments that were probably, in this time, closer to toys than actual scientific instruments. What Franklin was trying to establish with his experiments with lightning, of which the kite, as we'll see, was only one example and a bit of a stopgap, what he was trying to show was that there was a continuity between events which could be experimentally produced through electrical devices and events that took place on an incomparably greater scale in nature itself. The goal, in other words, was to achieve something on the level of what Newton himself had achieved, to show that events that take place in experimental situations, rolling bodies, say, on an inclined plane, sparks produced by electrical equipment, that these experimental events had an analog in something that takes place in the heavens. And in this process, Franklin would be able to demonstrate that electricity, an account of electricity, now had to become a central part of any account of natural philosophy. So, even if these experiments had had no practical implications, Franklin would have made a significant contribution to the understanding of nature. It bears remembering that there's no evidence at all that Franklin was really thinking of practical applications at this point. After all, this was a man who'd sold his printing firm, 
was living off the capital he'd amassed, and had written to some of his friends at this point that he hoped to have devote the rest of his life to scientific experimentation. As we know, certain political distractions in the 1770s and 1780s would interrupt his scientific work. Now, Franklin was concerned not simply with experimenting, but also with communicating the results of these experiments. And it's important to look at this because it suggests something about how the scientific community was organized in the 18th century. He began with a series of letters that described the experiments. He sent these to various researchers in England, and he followed it by writing a general summary of all of this in his book. The model here already begins to resemble something of what takes place in our own day. Papers appear first of all in scientific journals, although increasingly they're distributed first of all over the internet, and then eventually they may find publication in monograph form. It was in the context of an experiment that Franklin proposed in these writings, but did not actually carry out, that we first begin to see something that looks like the lightning rod. Franklin suggested that a collector could be attached to the top of what was called a sentry box, a little place where a man could stand, and that a man could be placed inside of that box on an insulated platform. The man could hold electrodes in his hands, uh, which again were insulated with, with wax, and with the approach of a thunderstorm, Franklin argued, it might be possible for the collector in the sentry box to begin to collect electricity from the clouds, allowing the man eventually to draw off a charge. Now Franklin's quite aware of the need to protect the individual in the box from electricity. He makes he's a great pains to stress that the box has to be kept dry. The uh, stand keeps the experimenter away from the ground. The electrodes are insulated. In the first drawings of this, or the first descriptions of this that Franklin gives, the collector itself is not, as we would say, grounded. Um, we're not yet dealing with a, with a device here that has a practical purpose. Its function is solely a way of verifying a certain scientific conjecture, the conjecture being that clouds contain electricity. We should notice also, finally, that Franklin doesn't carry out the experiment. He lacks the means to do it. There's no way of getting a collector that's going to be up high enough above the ground to be able to draw off electricity. In other words, this looks much more like a thought experiment than an actual proposal for research. The sentry box experiment is, however, performed in France, and the results are confirmed with additional experiments. And it's the success of these experiments that really establishes Franklin's name in France and quickly makes him into a leading figure in research into the electrical fire. Meanwhile, back in Philadelphia, Franklin, who doesn't know about the experiments in Paris, is waiting for a church steeple to be completed that would allow him to carry out the sentry box experiment. But while waiting, he hits upon the idea of an experiment using the stopgap of a kite held by an individual who is in a protected doorway. And Franklin emphasizes once again the importance of keeping the last part of the string dry. The experiment is tried. Uh, alterations in the behavior of the string are noted, and lo and behold, Franklin has given experimental confirmation of his theory that lightning and electricity are indeed linked. But we still don't have a lightning rod yet. The recognition that there might be practical implications from the work follows as a consequence of the research program that Franklin's engaged in, but it's not the motivation for the research program. Franklin had equipped his house with an ungrounded collector, as well as conducted experiments with it, and he observed the behavior that metal balls attached to the termination point. He observed the behavior of these balls when, when lightning storms approached. And it was while observing the ungrounded balls that he came to a realization that a grounded collector might allow for the safe transmission of electricity into the ground which, after all, had not really been the concern of his experiments since they were designed to collect electricity, not to dissipate it. So, recognizing at last that what he was doing might actually have considerable practical implications, he wrote up the idea. Now, it's worth noting also that lightning rods didn't work exactly as Franklin had planned. He seemed to think that you could use lightning rods to drain electricity from the clouds and prevent lightning strikes. He also realized that in the event of an actual lightning strike, 
the rod might serve as a way to carry off the charge harmlessly, but that really wasn't the initial idea. Once again, what he seems to have missed here was the dimension of scale, that no number of lightning rods could discharge a thundercloud, but it was, after all, an honest mistake. Franklin is really working outwards from a laboratory model, and the practical implications of the experiments are something that he only gradually realizes. Nevertheless, lightning rods work, though not in exactly the way Franklin planned, and they were tested and confirmed in practice over the next several years. But not without a certain amount of resistance, and here science enters once again into a familiar battle, a battle with superstition. There was, after all, a competing explanation for lightning. It was supposed to be caused by God, and if not by God, then by supernatural forces. There was also a well-established response to thunderstorms, in Europe at least. Church bells were to be rung to ward off evil spirits. Thus, the inscription that you find on a number of church bells, which praise their power, quote, to ward off lightning and malignant demons. Now, of course, church steeples tended to be struck far more often than any other places, and in the course of ringing bells, any number of bell ringers were electrocuted as the bell ropes became saturated with water. There was a treatise that was published in Munich in 1784 entitled, A Proof That the Ringing of Bells During Thunderstorms May Be More Dangerous Than Useful. And this treatise reports that in the last 33 years, 386 church towers had been struck and 103 bell ringers had been killed. And what's striking about this treatise is that to notice that at this point someone has actually decided to go about gathering statistics to prove the disutility of ringing bells. Franklin proposed a solution that was scientifically based and remarkably successful. It was opposed by some of the clergy, but was rather quickly adopted by others. San Marco in Venice was equipped with lightning rods, as was the cathedral in Siena. Uh, they were repeatedly struck, but the lightning rods carried off the electricity. In 1791, Pope Pius VI put a requirement in funds sent to rebuilding a lightning-damaged chapel in Assisi. The requirement was that the new building had to be equipped with Franklin rods. Now, the lightning rod is almost too perfect an illustration of the hopes of the Age of Enlightenment, because here was a case of scientific inquiry carried out by an international community of scholars that produced results which, as Bacon had promised, brought great blessings to mankind. And the man who stood at the center of these experiments would go on to become an international scientific celebrity with a reputation that would serve him well in the latter part of the century when he assumed diplomatic duties in France during the Revolution. For here was a man who, as the French economist and statesman Robert Jacques Turgot put it, quote, snatched the lightning from the sky and the scepter from tyrants. It's also worth remembering, though, that he was also a man who attended a lot of salons and drank a fair amount of coffee, and we'll talk about that in the next lecture. After listening to Lecture 5, a student posed this question to Professor Schmidt. Did you have to be a member of an academy to make a living as an intellectual? Let's listen to the professor's response. Well, for those who weren't members of academies, who weren't directly connected with the academies, there are a number of ways in which they might be able to make their contributions. One, which we've already talked about, but maybe should be emphasized again, would be these prize contests. Because after all, the prize contests were ways of awarding individuals for doing research, for presenting their ideas. The reward would come both in the form of monetary reward and also in the term of gaining, uh, also in the way of gaining a certain literary notoriety. This is, of course, as I suggested, the way in which Jean-Jacques Rousseau makes his, uh, his, his entry in, into the literary public sphere. Beyond that, sometimes there were simply cash awards which were available, uh, typically by governments, for certain particular problems that were quite pressing. For instance, take the problem of trying to, how to figure out longitude at sea, uh, an issue which is of great importance for the British government as, as a seafaring country. The British government establishes a prize of some 20,000 pounds for whoever is going to come up with a solution to this problem. The solution takes quite a while to be worked out, but nevertheless, this spurs a great deal of research in that area. Another student then asked, 
Can you tell me a little more about the idea of the public sphere? Let's listen to the professor's response. Well, the idea that there is something called the public sphere, and this is in some sense what really defines the world of the Enlightenment, this notion is associated, first of all, with this path-breaking book by the German social theorist Jürgen Habermas. It, like all initial statements of a thesis, there's much in this book that subsequent historical research has called into question. But nevertheless, it's it's led to a great deal of research, and that sense has been an important success in, in orienting studies. It's largely thanks to this work that people are concerned with these institutions, such as coffee houses, salons, and whatnot. In some sense, though, the notion of the Enlightenment as really being defined around a public sphere goes back to those very first answers to the question, what is Enlightenment? Because when Kant talks about the hallmark of enlightenment being something which he calls the public use of reason, what he's thinking of is a world in which people come together, discuss, debate, deliberate, exchange ideas, exchange ideas perhaps in scientific journals, but also exchange ideas in salons, in coffee houses, and in the myriad other institutions of this emerging public sphere. This ends Lecture 5. The Enlightenment, Lecture 6, The Emergence of the Public Sphere, Part 2, Coffee Houses and Salons. Having looked at scientific academies in the last lecture, what I want to look at in this lecture are two other institutions that played a major role in the shaping of the European public sphere during the Enlightenment, namely coffee houses and salons, while, as we'll see, they differed in some ways, both provided venues where private individuals could come together to discuss matters that were matters of public concern. And it may be worth keeping a few general questions in mind as we approach these institutions and indeed as we look at other parts of the public sphere. First, it may be worth asking how the forms of sociability that we find in these institutions are related to other transformations that are going on in the society. In other words, why do these places start emerging when they emerge? Secondly, it's always worth asking who has access to these new places? Who is the public that inhabits this public sphere? Or, to put it a bit more pointedly, who's excluded? And thirdly, in what ways do these forms of sociability foster types of reasoning that we could characterize as public reasoning or as public opinion? So, keeping these questions in mind, let's look first at coffee houses and then turn to the salon. Coffee houses flourished in Constantinople from at least the beginning of the 16th century. There's a report from a European traveler in 1620 who states, Coffee prevents those who consume it from feeling sleepy. For that reason, students who wish to read into the late hours are fond of it. Their first arrival in Europe occurred in Venice, which after all was the great conduit between Europe and the Byzantine world. This occurred in 1645. Certain Italian churchmen almost immediately denounced coffee as, quote, an infidel drink. But fortunately, Pope Clement VIII rebuffed their complaints and thus made it possible for good Christians to drink coffee. From there, they quickly spread, with coffee houses appearing at Oxford in 1650, in Hamburg in 1671, Paris in 1672, Vienna in 1683, and in various German cities throughout the 1680s. They took hold fairly quickly in Paris. By 1720, there were about 280 of them. By 1750, there were 600. By 1789, 900. If you look in Diderot's encyclopedia at the entry on coffee, he defines coffee houses as, quote, places whose establishment gave rise to the use of coffee and where all manner of strong liquor are consumed. They are also manufacturers of ideas, good as well as bad. The most famous Parisian coffee houses were the Procope, which was frequented by Diderot and Voltaire, and it's still in business on the left bank. Uh, 
the Regence, which was frequented by chess players, and as we'll see in a later lecture, is the point of departure for Diderot's great dialogue, Rameau's Nephew. Monarchs in German states sought to stifle the coffee craze by encouraging the consumption of herbal teas. The reasoning here is straightforward economics. Coffee had to be imported, hence it was going to lead to trade deficits, and they had some success in stemming the growth of coffee drinking in Germany. Berlin didn't get a coffee house until 1721, and by 1781 there were only 12 in the city. But on the other hand, Hamburg, which had ties to England via the dynasty, the Hanoverian dynasty, was always a hotbed of coffee consumption, and indeed Hamburg was a part of Germany that was a hotbed of free thinking in general. But perhaps the most famous testimony to the spread of the coffee craze in Germany is a cantata that Johann Sebastian Bach wrote in 1723. It's written, it's one of his secular cantatas, it's not for the church. It's written to a text which records the travails of a middle-class Leipzig family whose daughter suffers from coffee addiction. She briefly considers giving up the beverage when the prospect of marriage is dangled in front of her, but then concludes that she will reject any suitor who forbids her from drinking coffee. And there's a magnificent final trio to the work, to the words, quote, cats won't leave the mice alone, young girls will remain sisters to coffee. Now, appropriately enough, the first performance of the coffee cantata takes place in Gottfried Zimmermann's coffee house in Leipzig, which was established in 1720. This is a coffee house that boasts two concert halls on its second floor. One of these concert halls could seat up to 150 people. Now, at this point, the city of Leipzig doesn't have a concert hall, and unless you go to the Thomaskirche, the Thomas Church, where Bach's sacred works are performed, the only place you're going to be able to hear music in Leipzig is at Zimmermann's Coffee House. That is until competing coffee houses start building their own concert halls. So Zimmermann's Coffee House was the main venue for performances of Bach's instrumental group, the uh, Collegium Musicum. But it was in England where coffee seems to have had the biggest impact. By the end of the 17th century, and note, I'm speaking correctly here, the 17th century, the end of the 17th century, not the end of the 18th century, there were already 2,000 coffee houses in London, and they soon spread to Scotland and Ireland. Total consumption in the 1680s of coffee in England is estimated at about 100 tons per year, which would, for those that can do the math, enable 15,500 people to drink one coffee a day for a year. It bears remembering that not everyone in coffee houses was drinking coffee. They were there to drink other beverages, and so the traffic through coffee houses during this period must have been truly considerable. But figures like this only begin to measure the impact of coffee in England. A letter from the period reports, quote, whereas formerly Apprentices and clerks used to take their morning draught in ale, beer, or wine, which by dizziness they cause in the brain make many unfit for business. They use now to play the good fellows in this wakeful and civil drink. Those last words, I think, are really essential, this wakeful and civil drink. It's worth remembering coffee is a powerful stimulant. Individuals went into coffee houses to transact business and, as one pamphlet from 1675 explains, quote, go out more sprightly about their affairs than before. But the letter tells us that coffee was not just simply a wakeful drink, it was also a civil drink. And we need to explore the implications of that word in a bit more detail. Coffee houses proved to be quite controversial and the case against them was made principally by defenders of the monarchy. There were a number of charges. First of all, coffee houses as a foreign invention were supposed to be un-English. They were supplanting the good English custom of drinking to the health of the king, and they thwarted that sort of beery fraternity that came when men start drinking together. Ale drinkers purchase in multiple rounds, but no one buys multiple rounds of coffee, nor does one typically drink toasts to the king with it. There was also a second charge. After drinking multiple rounds of ale, men would go out to engage in what during this period was known as wenching. 
This is an activity that was facilitated by the geography of public houses, which had various secluded corners, and by the ready availability of prostitutes with whom one could wench. It was charged that coffee made men incapable of wenching because it dried out their fluids, leaving them, as one pamphlet put it, as parched as the deserts of Araby. One pamphlet, entitled The Woman's Petition Against Coffee, warned that men who spent too much time in coffee houses, quote, run the risk of being cuckolded by dildos. A decline in the population loomed in the near future. But there was one final thing about coffee houses that was even more troubling. Another pamphlet charged that coffee houses, quote, resemble Amsterdam. In other words, they were sites where different classes and different types of people mingled and engaged in anti-monarchical political speculation. Now, absurd though these charges may be, the last charge may not be completely in error. Coffees do seem to be places where political discussion was possible. The pictures that emerge from the writings of Addison and Steele and from various other descriptions of these coffee houses is of places where people held forth on various issues that were of public concern, thus fulfilling our definition of the public sphere. This is a place where private individuals come together to reason about public issues. Everything we know about coffee houses suggests that, from the start, they were places where people went to talk about politics. The discussion of politics in coffee houses was aided by one important feature that all coffee houses shared, the ready availability of newspapers in them. Coffee houses rather quickly became a place where publications were read and views were published. Newspapers of every sort were available to be read and scrutinized. And in reading and discussing them, individuals who were called in certain of the pamphlets from this period, coffee house politicians, well, these individuals were, quote unquote, publishing their own ideas. In other words, presenting them to other individuals in the coffee house, while other individuals, some of them working at the behest of the crown or perhaps of leaders in parliament, were publishing the ideas of others in the form of news or gossip. In that sense, Coffee houses became one of the first places where we see political spin being created and being manipulated. Now, there's a petition from Lloyd's Coffee House that's published in the Tatler of 1710 that suggests that the discussion of politics has grown to the point where patrons want to formalize it, if only as a way of allowing less restrained conversation to return at other times. Hence, there's a proposal here that there should be a regular reading of news from a pulpit in the coffee house with commentary from those politicians who inhabit the coffee house and criticisms from others. Lest this be taken all as an effort at jest, there's another pamphlet from the period that proposes that clergy themselves who have been talking about political matters from their pulpits should be forced to come into coffee houses and made to repeat their sermons before an audience, which in a coffee house, unlike in a church, is able to ask questions. There is one further step in this process, which occurs at the close of the first decade of the 18th century, and that is the emergence of journals edited by Joseph Addison and Richard Steele called The Tatler and The Spectator. These are journals whose character itself is shaped by the culture of the coffee houses, and the explicit goal of these journals is to comment on what takes place inside the coffee houses. They were addressed, as the Tatler put it in one article, to worthy citizens who live more in a coffee house than in their shops. It speaks, these journals speak, in other words, to individuals who had migrated from the world of purely private concerns to a world where, to repeat the formula from Jürgen Habermas, private individuals discuss public matters. In an article in The Spectator, Steele observed that there were two sorts of men who came into coffee houses. There are those who come to conduct affairs, others who come to enjoy conversation. It was the latter group for whom The Spectator was intended. And these journals did so by responding to letters that were sent by readers. Addison placed a letterbox shaped like a giant lion's head with a gaping mouth in Button's coffee house for anyone who wanted to submit essays. 
The circuit of communications now starts to close in on itself. In a coffee house, one reads and discusses a newspaper that contains information about what is being read and discussed in other coffee houses. Thus, readers of an article in Spectator number 403 could read what had been said not only in their own coffee house, but in other coffee houses as well, about rumors of the death of Louis XIV. And they could also read, in Spectator number 568, what had been said in a coffee house where individuals were busy discussing an article from an even earlier issue of The Spectator. Here, the circle of readers and writers become very close indeed. We still have to talk, though, about the relationship between coffee and civility. After all, coffee is supposed to be a wakeful and civil beverage. What do we mean, in the 18th century anyway, with this adjective civil? The word itself comes from the Latin civitas, city, and thus meaning literally something concerning the city. When Samuel Johnson tried to define it in his great dictionary of 1755, he winds up mostly explaining what it isn't. He starts out well enough. Number one, relating to the community, political, relating to the city or government. Then he goes on, not in anarchy, not wild, not without rule or government, not foreign, not ecclesiastical, not natural, not military, not criminal, civilized, not barbarous, complacent, civilized, gentle, well-bred, elegant of manners, not rude, not brutal, not coarse, grave, sober, not gay or showy. Now, this is a list that could almost serve as an outline for the code of values that the Tatler and the Spectator were trying to inculcate, a mode of life that was coming into being in the great cities of Europe, a mode of life lived by men who were engaged in the affairs of the city, but who looked beyond their immediate concerns to consider matters that, up until this point, had been the sole concern of the royal court. The court, as we know from our earlier discussion of Versailles, had elaborate rituals, and taken together, these constituted something called courtesy, the rules of the court. But here, in the city, something new was being worked out, a new set of rules by individuals who were not likely to be nobles or to have connections to the court. The English name for these rules was civility, and the world these values were creating was something that came to be known as a civil or sometimes a civilized society. There's one passage from The Spectator that captures this world beautifully. It's an essay by Steele. He talks about the coffee house as a place of rendezvous for all those who, quote, relish the calm and ordinary life. Those denizens of the coffee house for whom he had the greatest regard were those who derived their entertainments, as he put it, from reason rather than the imagination. He goes on, which is the cause that there is no impatience or instability in their speech or action. You see in their countenance that they are at home and in quiet possession of the present instant as it passes without desiring to quicken it by gratifying any passion or prosecuting any new design. These are the men formed for society and those little communities which we express by the word neighborhoods. This is a very strange and lovely passage, far from heeding maybe our typical sense of what these people might have been like. People who, uh, the bourgeois, someone who pursues the dictum that time is money, here are men who simply take a calm pleasure in the present instant. They pursue no designs. They simply revel in the joys of being a city dweller. And here they try to take in all that London can provide. Now, at about the same time that the English were flocking to coffee houses, there was another gathering place taking place in France. That was the Salon. And we'll talk about it now. The word Salon originated as a name for a place, eventually it goes on to become a name for a type of gathering. It referred originally to a room in a house where, as Diderot's encyclopedia again defines it, one reposes when one returns from the hunt or from a walk, where one gambles and where one gives dinners of consequence. During the 17th century, 
It would have primarily been a place for diversions, which the aristocracy engages in, and it would be a way of filling the social void that was left with the withdrawal of the monarchy to Versailles. The function of salons, however, starts to change dramatically by the middle of the 18th century. It's transformed from a leisure institution of the nobility, with an emphasis on entertainment, into an institution which increasingly becomes involved in the production, exchange, and eventually the transmission of ideas. The historian Dina Goodman has argued that there are really two forces at work in bringing about this change. First of all, they're the philosophes. In the middle of the century, the group that's involved in the production of Diderot's great encyclopedia, which, which once again, I can promise you that we'll get to this, we'll talk about it in a subsequent lecture, the group that's involved in the production of Diderot's encyclopedia has begun to make its move into some of the central institutions of French cultural, social, 